Zoltan, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. I, I'm going to tell you guys out there, you're really in for a treat today. My guest is Zoltan Eastvon, and he is a transhumanist. He founded the Transhumanist Party and is running for president, and they have him polling as high as six in, the, in some polls that way. Is that right? That's correct. Mm-hmm. And so he used to work for National Ge- Geographic as a journalist, and he's a writer. He's written stuff for Huffington Post, Vice, a bunch of other stuff out there. And you may not be totally familiar with this idea of transhumanism or, or what that means, but it is really exciting stuff. Oh, I know another thing. You're futurist. You call yourself a futurist? Uh, I do. I do call myself a futurist. Well, I, the, the future and technology and science is some of the stuff that I'm just the most interested in. So this is, I can't tell you guys how excited I am to spend the next hour talking to you. Um, so we're, gonna, we're just going to get into what that is. I wish everybody already knew what transhumanism is, but I don't think they do. So we might have to start right there with just what does that word even mean? And then we'll get into more conversational stuff. But let's start there if you don't mind. Absolutely. You know, so transhumanism is a social movement of a few million people around the world that want to use radical science and radical technology Mm -hmm. to modify the human body and also to modify the human experience. It can be anything from exoskeleton suits to robotic arms, virtual reality, driverless cars, Mm -hmm. whatever radical tech and science that you know of, that's basically a a part of the transhumanist movement. And we're a social group that, you know, like I said, all around the world now, many, many millions of people that want to use it to really upgrade the human being. Upgrade the human being. I love it. It's so so interesting to talk about. So on one hand, the simplest thing you could say would be like a like you, like you mentioned an exoskeleton, something that could help somebody that uh, walk or run faster or climb a mountain, stuff like that. But on the far end of the spectrum, we're talking about way off stuff like um, the human race evolving beyond human. I mean, is that is that part of the the conversation too? Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the most, uh, I'd say, sci-fi or wacky concepts that people think of when they think of transhumanism is uploading your consciousness into a computer. Uh And we already have telepathy um, that exists. You know, you can go to your uh, a superstore, Walmart, whatever, and buy a brainwave headset. Well, and you can do very basic things like you can play a video game on your iPhone Mm -hmm. just by using thoughts as long as you have that right headset. So we're kind of already approached this age of using a machine to interface with our consciousness. Right. But at some point, we might be able to upload our entire consciousness into a machine and recreate who we are. And of course, one of the main things of transhumanism is I'd say the number one goal is we want to eliminate death or uh-huh. conquer death through science and technology. So uploading your consciousness to a machine is one day, one way to preserve your identity so that you can avoid death. It, now, again, it's I don't really uh, promote the idea of uploading one's consciousness because it's kind of a, a bit of a wacky and crazy idea. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of other ways to eliminate death, you know, either through replacing organs with bionic parts or through reversing aging through genetic technologies and stuff like that. But mind uploading is fascinating. It's like virtual reality, but instead of right. the, you know, putting on the headset, you are already built into that system. Mm-hmm. Well. You know, that, we're right into the heavy stuff straight away, but I, that is such a hard concept for anybody to get their head around, and it sounds like a bad... I mean, I think most people would go, well, that sounds like a bad idea, you know, unless you're really forward-thinking about what you would do, but it doesn't it just bring up a meat... Do you get bogged down in a bunch of ethical stuff like that? Like, as soon as you say something like, upload your consciousness, it's like, well, how does that work? Or you can't do that, I mean... Uh, oh, of course, because there's so many... I mean... Think of every single institution in America. And there's one reason why in my presidential campaign I don't speak too much about uploading is because, well, first off, are you a male, a female? Are you different inside a machine? Yeah. Um, then the the sense is, well, is there is, are there any laws as a side, you know, as a kind of virtual entity? Uh, if you're a believer in faith and God or anything, yeah. I'm not. I'm an atheist, but is that apply? I mean, is God there in the virtual entity? You know, and and who controls that virtual environment? Like some people had said, Elon Musk wants to send satellites up into the sky and create his own form of the internet. Well, does that mean someone else controls the environment you're in, mm-hmm. your life is in? So it gets very twisty and very thorny very quickly. And um, that said, from a philosophical perspective, it's absolutely fascinating to consider because it really does stretch your mind in many different directions. Yeah, and that's what I like about it, even just as the exercise of it. I, I'm not sure it's possible, and I don't know if anybody's sure it's possible, but I, I keep hearing that idea more and more, like it really would be possible 
Sounds far fetched, but maybe not. But here's the here's the thought experiment I use. If I was sitting at a table and you were able to replicate my consciousness right beside me, let's say right there while I was sitting in the room, that would theoretically be possible at that time. And the whole point of this is so that you as the doctor, you're going to upload my consciousness, then my body's going to die and I get to live on. But at that moment, when you make the uploaded copy, and then I would sit there and say, okay, well, I'm good. You can go ahead and kill me now because I'm over there in that computer. I would never, as the copy of the, con- the, the local, the original copy, I'd still never, I still wouldn't be okay with dying. It would still, to my experience, be me dying, right? Of course, of course. And th- that's part of you know, all the thorniness of it. In fact, in my novel, The, the Transhumanist Wager, it establishes a kind of a basic amount of you know, the three laws of transhumanism of which they become known. And the very first law is like you must always preserve your self-identity or your, your life. And um, many people say if they get uploaded into a computer, the very first thing they're going to do is clone themselves a million times and spread it throughout as many <laughs> systems as possible. Because that's the ne- – it's like if you're given one wish, you know, let's say you're given – you find a lamp on the beach and you have three wishes. The very first wish – for many logical perspective, is to wish for an unlimited amount Uh of wishes. And uh, I think the same thing would hold true for uploading your consciousness. And uh, and again, like I said, the basics of the technology now exist. It's actually even available to consumers, this idea that you can upload algorithms of your thought process into machines. And if you could do that enough times, you might be able to do it. So I can tell you this is going to be an incredible debate for the next 10 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. And then probably within 15 years, People are going to start actually trying to do this. There, in fact, there are a number of companies out there that already, once you die, you upload certain things into machines. So, for example, your Facebook account can continue on after you've died, making releases, new releases, based on algorithms mm-hmm. of what your preferences were. So, if you want to, like, some, you know, your uh, your child dies and he used to like soccer or something like this, all these terrible things. Yet that child would still live on in social media. That's the very basic part of this kind of Uh uh, virtual reality identity. Now, of course, as time goes on in five years, that could be much more complex when we start throwing in basic AI. And then in 10 years, it could actually be a a thinking person that actually may involve with age. You know, I mean, but would you transfer your awareness, your self awareness? Do you think that could transfer as well to where you would be in the computer and you'd take a deep (laughs) breath like, Ah, oh, I'm in this computer. I feel, you know what? This well, is me. Yeah, it, here we go. If if the machine is simply a bunch of meat, and that meat is three pounds approximately, and that meat is full of you know subatomic particles that move in certain directions, then and it can be replicated. Well, then the replication can be the exact copy of yourself. Mm-hmm. That's the idea. Now, it may not be the exact copy at that moment, uh, based on the Heisenberg principle and other things. But it will be so close that you and I probably wouldn't even notice the difference. Uh-huh. Now, that's, of course, again, we're going down this philosophical uh, rabbit hole. But, um, you know, I did my senior thesis in college on brains in the vat on simulation uh-huh. theory, which is essentially right. the same thing. How can we prove that you and but I are actually not, not brain already? In a vat right now. Yeah, that uh-huh. we're already not in the computer and right. we're having this conversation. And frankly, the best philosophers in the world still haven't been able to conclusively prove mm-hmm. that they're not I can't that. prove that we're not that. Yeah, I've, t- I've thought about that a, a bit before and talked about it. Is uh, So simulation theory is Bostrom did that a lot, right? He's the guy that talks a lot about that, right? Yeah, he's definitely one of the leaders. In is it. he a transhumanist? Does he identify that way? So, you know, Nick Bostrom was one of the original founders of the Transhumanist Association, which was one of the first groups for transhumanism. He has since distanced himself, I think, mm-hmm. a little bit from the the word itself and from the movement. It's grown a lot since that happened about 15, 20 years ago. And I think people sometimes distance themselves from the social movement because the social movement is kind of known as either being a little wacky, a little weird. I mean, after all, look at what we're talking mm-hmm. about. And, you know, he's now, an, uh, you know, a professor at Oxford. So it's hard yeah. to carry a career. But, uh, you know, obviously he still believes entirely in these concepts. He writes about them all the time and he writes a lot about A.I., so, you know, he is definitely on board. Uh, whether he uses the word transhumanism, I haven't heard sure. him use it in a few years. Sure. Well, the, the, whole, I, the whole idea behind it and advancement and using science and tech and embracing it is really what my big takeaway from it is, is the amount of resistance that people have to science and new things and the potential ethical dilemmas that it brings up is just so strong and so severe. And like In my assessment, people just so overreact to 
potential new technologies. They demonize them every single time. Uh, do you have any idea why that is? It, well, you know, don't get me going on a rant here, but let me just tell you what's happening and what, what is happening also with my presidential campaign and one of the reasons why I'm actually running for president. So we have 535 members of Congress and we have eight Supreme Court justices right now. And we have a president. Every single one of them publicly believes in God and every single one of them publicly believes in an afterlife. That's not very good for transhumanism because uh -huh. Most people would say that the Bible does not support modifying your being to become <laughs> as powerful as you can be. I mean, transhumanists want to use science and technology to become as powerful, powerful as, as they can, can be. be. Yeah, yeah. But that's not very – that's not good according to the Bible. You're not supposed to try to upgrade yourself and well, become godlike. Well, let's You're supposed just to be humble servants. There, though. I mean, like if you just talk about – what, there's tons of advancements we've made technologically to better ourselves from LASIK surgery to ACL what replacement or of artificial hip, whatever. So, so no problem think, there. That's not scary. I, I, yeah, I think most uh, religious people would accept that. The problem is um, now we're starting to cross over to this with CRISPR gene editing technology, which came out in the last few years. Mm -hmm. um, this is this genetic technology. We can alter things. We're now talking about augmenting our intelligence. Um, we're now talking about creating super muscles. We're now talking about making uh, everybody six foot five instead. You know, and 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 you know, now it's different. Now we're sort of playing with nature itself before it was like you had a problem you had a headache you took some advil no one complained well what if you took a pill that made you 30 percent smarter but your neighbor didn't have access to that pill yeah. then all of a sudden it's like wow look at all the mm -hmm. ethical conundrums so but transhumanism wants to go way beyond the 30 percent we want to become a trillion times smarter <laughs> like machines now all of a sudden you're talking about potentially yeah. as being as smart as god and you know i would openly say of course transhumanists want to become god mm -hmm. and and i think that's where the dilemma is when you talk about this conflict of why some people don't accept technology because their qu first question is where well, where does it end i hear yeah. this all the time zoltan where does it end? And I say, well, it ends with you becoming as powerful as you can through technology. And that's when they say, well, that's not what the Bible wanted us to do. The Bible wanted us to be, you know, live a nice life and, and ask for forgiveness for our sins. And, and that's the conundrum. You know, 75 percent of Americans are Christian. So now, you know, the, the fundamental dilemma between transhumanism and American government and the American people. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I don't think that I don't I think it's a lot more complicated than that. Especially just when you talk about that seventy five percent of Christians, there's so many different kinds. I identify as a Christian myself, but I'm totally on board with every all the transhumanist stuff. It makes no sense not to be, um, from my point of view. So I figure, no matter what, we've got to. All we've ever done is try to improve, and I believe with em embracing science and technology, all we're going to do is increase, or at least the aim should be, to increase the welfare of the most people the, the best you can. And technology is, the so far, the best method we've had of improving people's lives. I mean, it, you know what I mean? Don't you think? Yeah, no, and, no and, and what you've just said is perfect. Now, if every American believed like you did, there wouldn't be a conflict. Because I feel the same way as you. I was I was raised a Catholic, went to Catholic school. In my opinion, uh, whether you're religious or not religious, mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, when I say I'm an atheist, I don't really know if I'm an atheist. I mean, I have no idea what's going on generally right. is what I really say. I'm an agnostic. I have no idea. There's a trillion galaxies out there. Who knows how far things go? But the most important thing for me is that no matter what your beliefs are, if you believe that technology and science can improve your health, improve the health of your loved ones, improve the health of your neighbors and your community, that's a good thing. Because mm -hmm. who wants anything other than the best health, the, the, the best strength, the best to get through diseases and things like that for the people we love? And that's really what transhumanism comes down to. It's simply this idea that we want to better people through science and technology. The problem, though, of course, is that the extremes of both sides make it into a conflict. And um, it, it, like I said, it, many people, I just took a, a national bus tour across the country. And in the South, as soon as I told yeah. people that I have a, a, a small implant in my hand, they freaked out saying, yeah. oh, it's the mark of the beast, it's these things. But the truth is, I have an implant in my hand for a very single reason. Um, when I go running out the door and I go for a jog, I just hate taking my keys. And instead, this allows me to start my car, allows me to open my door. It allows me, I don't have the chip right now, but it allows you to pay. So there's, it's just another facet of technology yep. that's built into the system. Now, 
when people got their social security numbers, everyone freaked out saying, oh, this is also anti-Christian number mm-hmm. of the beast. But the reality is we've all accepted social security numbers. I think we're all going to accept technology too. I think and so with, too. With, with the idea you have, it's like if that was the case, then there would be so much more government funding. And that's really been one of the main things with transhumanism is we don't, you know, America spends 20% of its GDP on bombs, on military, on defense, that's and nice. only 2% on science. Uh-huh. So they spend 10 times the amount on bombs than they do science. If we think we can get more politicians to be more open-minded, and they can keep their faith. That's fine with me. We're, we're certainly open to faiths. Um, but just to understand that faith might be a part of God, mm-hmm. it might be a part of the bigger picture, then I think a lot more funding could come into transhumanism, and then we would really be able to cure cancer. Mm-hmm. You know, a third of people die from heart disease. Everyone you know, a third of them are going to die from heart disease. We can take out heart disease with the artificial heart, but no one has put enough money into it, and we need the government to do that. It, it's imperative that the United States government stands behind science because they're oftentimes the largest of the funders for the mm-hmm. kinds of research. But if they don't have incentive because of either cultural beliefs or religious beliefs, they're not going to do it. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's a slow adoption curve on technology, and it's a generational thing, too. And, you know, I'm 37 years old, and I've made it, you know, the people that I went to high school with, the people I grew up with are – in the, I grew up in a small town in the south, and those people, a lot of the people I went to high school with still work on a construction site or do vinyl siding or something like that. They definitely aren't on Snapchat or have chips in their uh, hand there. They do not at all. <laughs> and I know every time I come to some new technology that I think these kids do, and I, I'm in the music industry and I'm around younger people all the time, and they always frustrate me with these new things that I don't understand. I remember when Twitter was new, and I, I want to resist it. Everything I want to resist and say, well, I'm too old for that, and I make myself every time. You cannot do that. It's, it's like a principle of mine, and I try to evangelize, if you will, everybody, you must lean into the new technologies as uncomfortable or as foreign as they are. You'll only be more behind by taking that that attitude of, well, I, I missed the boat on that. You still got a long way to go. You don't know how long our life's going to go or even extend. You've got to stay with it or you risk, I think, some of the people now who are going to be that are in their 30s and 40s now, by the time they're 60, if they don't stay with it, they're going to be the most left behind generation of all time, given the speed that things increase. Of course. And I think that's the most important thing we just said about, you know, speed increasing is whatever happened in the last 10 years in terms of change, in terms of uh, technological innovation, it's going to happen in five years, right. uh, the next five years. And then after that five years, it's going to happen in 2.5. And then it's going to happen in one and a quarter. Technological innovation exponentially grows. And that's the most important thing to understand. Just a few years ago, we were talking about driverless cars like it was some science fiction it was concept. Gonna be, you're right. Five years ago, it was way, it was way off. Yeah. Now they're on the road. Yeah. And just a few days ago or like a few weeks ago, Uber, we thought Uber was going to create all these jobs for all these new people to be Uber drivers. And now they're talking about driverless <laughs> Uber drivers. Yeah. So all of a sudden, in the span of two years, this entire great idea of all these brand new people having jobs um, has gone away because now we have driver's cars. It's changing so quickly, yeah. it, like so dramatically quickly. Um, the CRISPR technology I mentioned, the genetic editing, mm-hmm. you know, literally people are messing around with growing a third arm or mm-hmm. messing around with growing a third eye in the back of their head. Mm-hmm. And that's what this genetic technology allows you to do. And, you know, okay, that sounds weird, the stuff I mentioned, but more importantly, it's already been used to cure cancer, some cancers. And, um, it's going to be very important up front with we're having new children. We could cure heart disease before it ever happens. Right. Like my father's had four heart attacks, for example. He's only 71 years old. Um, if we could have had a baby cured that genetic trait of his, right. he would never have had these heart attacks. His whole life would have been different. Yeah. Well, you know, if I think about that in the sense that it's it's easy for me to look farther ahead and say, well, you got to die of something and you don't really want to live forever. You can I can see arguments for that, and I kind of want to get in that in a minute. But it's so weird once a, a, you, you have once you have the ability for something, to not use it seems like a, a moral error, right? Like if you didn't uh, rescue a baby, if you didn't stop a snake from this, if you didn't use the vaccine for malaria in a, a place or whatever it is, if you fail to operate to to do something that could help or save another person, it seems wrong. 
But on the other hand, looking far into the future, it feels like, oh, you're playing God and you're changing genetics and you're not supposed to do this. But once the technology exists and becomes ubiquitous or accessible, it will inevitably feel wrong not to save a baby in the womb that has a congenital heart defect, right? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I think You'd be we a have monster a man- not to. So yeah, what we exactly. Doing? We have a mandate to do so. And one of the things I often tell people when they say you're playing God is I say, I don't think you realize how, ama- you know, if God exists, I don't think you realize how amazing God could be. We're talking about something that could be a hundred trillion times smarter than us. Right. So just because we fix a congenital disease in birth is not something that is, uh, you know, that spectacular. It's not that much more spectacular than the first primate making an ax. We mm-hmm. are newbies. We are yeah. little tiny infants that are, you know, creating this kind of um, technology to, to, and we're going to have, in the future, we're going to be like pure spiritual energy machines, <laughs> all this other stuff. Then we can start talking yeah. about how, how, how creative we are, how godlike we are. We're, we're still pieces of flesh. Sure. We have a three-pound piece of meat. If somebody punctures that three-pound piece of meat, we're over. We're, we're pretty fragile creatures. Absolutely. And I think we have a long way to go. So you talk about bionics, but then you also mentioned CRISPR, which I'm glad I've talked to, to about that a bit before and familiar with it. Um, it's weird because at first this stuff sounds like tech and technology, and it's like when you look at a sci-fi movie from the 80s or 90s, it's unbelievable machinery, but then as it turns out, the future is much cleaner and nicer. And so when I was first thinking of these types of thoughts of future and integrating technology with a human body and chips, it sounds like a bunch of mechanical stuff. But now when you think about CRISPR and all this other stuff, you realize it's going to be biological, a lot of it in nature, more so than physical machinery. Exoskeleton, sure, we'll do that in the next few decades. But beyond that, it seems like biotech might be the, the bigger frontier, 3D printing and nano uh, stuff that will be invisible and, you know, more, it'll be actually maybe more like improved physiology versus living in a pod. Which way is it going to go? Well, uh, you know, I think you kind of nailed on the head. It's probably going to be improved physiology for almost all the reasons we've been talking about. When I talk about becoming a machine, everyone says, now that is freaky. When I talk about improving my genetic structure and becoming a a stronger human being, everyone says, hey, I like that. That's almost like like going to the gym. (laughs) You know, it's not that different. So I think what's happened is from a commercial point of view, and and let's be honest, everything is driven by capitalism right now. Everyone's driven by people creating the stuff and selling the stuff. And, you know, that's just the framework we have right now. Um, Companies are doing better with genetic technologies than they are on telling you you're going to have a better, you know, there's no question in my mind that a robotic arm is going to be better in 10 years time than a human arm. But I bet the companies that make a improved uh, biological arm Mm -hmm. are probably going to do (laughs) be worth a lot more money than the robotic arm. And the reason is for what exactly my wife said. Well, I like your idea of a robotic arm, but I don't know if I want to sleep next to you. Right. You know, it's just like that's just weird. And but she says if you can take a pill and become, or you know, have some yes. kind of uh, genetic treatments and become, you know, like Arnold Schwarzenegger or something, that's a whole different mm-hmm. ball game. Th- then it's like so maybe we're going to end up, and I'd say probably this is the case just because of of the way ethics are going. People are going to feel more comfortable with improving their biology first, yeah, yeah. and then we'll later look at you know whether it's time to become machines or cyborgs at some yeah, point. Yeah, well, we do insane things to our biology right now, and pills are a great example because we're willing to take – I mean, the, the whole notion is people are insanely selfish and uh, really <laughs> greedy about what they can get for their body, especially if it's like if they could take a diet pill to lose weight or gain muscle – or st- you know, even steroids, you have to work out to, to get the benefit, even if you're taking steroids. But if there was a pill that you could take to just be stronger, and the way we use antidepressants, so we barely even understand how they work, people are eager to do simple fixes. So if there was one to in- change your genetics, your internal stuff, you, you better believe people will be all over it. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll think, well, at least for me, I don't care about everybody else, but at least for me, I'd like the intelligence boost, please. There's no yeah, way no, that, I, that won't, you know, run wild. Of course, of course. And I think that's why this is, this industry is going to become so powerful is because it's really not, you know, taking a, gen, a pill that genetically makes you stronger versus taking an Advil is hardly different. Right. Whereas if you actually cut off your arm and <laughs> put on a robotic arm, and even if you can throw a football a mile, 
Um, <laughs> it's still too weird given all the different mm. circumstances. I got an infant. Does the infant feel comfortable with this metal arm? Yeah. You know, and, and, and the, the, you know, there's all these different things. So I think, um, you know, the, the short term transhumanist boom is really in making ourselves better through those you know, the kinds of just remaining biological. It's almost like if there's a pill that takes you to the gym and makes you in perfect health, that's going to be what's going to sell, you know, the millions. But it's still, and then in the longer term, we'll go from these human improvements and enhancements to like, uh, obviously virtual worlds would be a a very simple, obvious concept that's coming where where you may be able to live in alternate realities that are creatable or limitable or unlimited based on how we program them, I guess. Um, but what's interesting to me is when you talk about the bionics and the just human improvement, if you could have bionic eyes, let's say, and ears. So I'm a musician by trade. That's what I do. And I realize that all of art that we do, for instance, which occupies so much of our economy and people's thoughts and enjoyment and pleasure, it comes from a couple of our five senses and interpreting some very small amounts of data of sound waves and light waves. And so if we really were... And I've heard you speak about this before. If we really were able to have better eyesight that we could see all across the spectrum or if we could hear across the spectrum or if we could uh, be able to read, uh, you know, electromagnetic radiation. If we if we developed a really refined sense of that, that we could build on the human scaffolding. Well, I guess it would open up enormous amounts of aesthetic and artistic appreciation. Right. A hundred percent. You know, I've actually written a funny, I'll have to email it to you, but I've written an interesting article for, for Vice about the future of music because I have, um, you know, the cochlear implants um, is one of the most important and widespread of the brain implants that we have. About 300,000 people around the world mm-hmm. have an implant because they're here, they're deaf or whatever, and it allows them to hear things. And what's interesting about that is it allows them to hear things that you and I cannot hear. Um, it allows them to tie, you know, already tap into certain types of frequencies. And just so you know, what you hear is literally approximately one percent of the spectrum of sound waves in the universe right now. Your ears cannot hear more than one percent. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe it's a few percent. It depends on, and uh, you know, who, what the studies are done. But whatever it is, you're missing out on a huge amount. Your ears miss out on a huge amount. Right. The, the technology that we have allows us to hear a huge amount more of the spectrum. And this is why blind people that have actual artificial eyes and bi- robotic eyes are able to actually have a, a, a telescopic vision that is better than the human vision. Amazing. Now, yeah. And so you're all of a sudden, and this is very interesting also given the fact that we have the Paralympics going on right now. I've said, I've been on the record before saying that in 10 years, um, disabled athletes are going to run faster. Uh, and jump further than the best Olympians we have because of the technology. In fact, somebody who's quadriplegic, probably within one decade's time, will run faster with an exoskeleton suit than Bolt, than the fastest man alive. Mm -hmm. That's how fast this technology is growing. But back to the brain implants, especially the cochlear implants, which, you know, ties into your hearing nerve, you're going to be able to not only hear different types of sensations, but you're going to be able to hear things that instruments would never have been heard, like things that only animals can hear Mm -hmm. and other things that only machines have been able to create that some animals can hear. This is going to open up music like we've never heard before. Totally. You think music stuck just through the different notes we have. Actually, music's in, in a few years, music's going to expand. I mean, imagine Mozart could hear some of this stuff. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, exactly. it's, it's a growing field. All these fields are growing. Yeah, and just, I mean, if, you, if we had a new sense, let's say electromagnetic vibration or, or fields, if we could determine them, like the most crudest thing possible would be a sensor that you have and you can detect if there's a field, electro magnetic energy in the place or not okay that's the most basic thing possible but if you keep refining it and its sensitivity and what it is eventually there will no doubt be a form of aesthetic art on arrangement of electromagnetic field you know it'll be appreciable do you know what i'm saying it would actually be something you could be obsessed with how beautiful the patterns of electromagnetism are that, that are invisible to people now it'd open up these whole new realms of of thought and and art and entertainment and pleasure that you can't even we don't we don't even have access to now yeah and actually believe it or not there are actually a few cyborgs on planet earth earth already that have something similar to that there's neil harbinson who has an antenna out of his head and he was born colorblind and this antenna recognizes colors by it's computerized recognizes colors 
by vibrating certain ways um, when it see, when it recognizes a certain color, and then it vibrates a certain way in his head, and he's learned to see colors through that type of antenna. But that's just one way that you can start interpreting art in different ways. And of course, you know, friends do things like send email him pictures indirectly into the antenna of where they're at. Like, say, you're on the beach in the Bahamas, and he can feel what that's right. like as opposed to see it. So when we talk about what the future is going to be like, re- reality is is very, very small to us right now. Yeah, like we I have said, very limited access yeah, to what reality we, we see, is. We see way below 1% of the light spectrum of the universe right mm-hmm. now. And um, in the future, if we're going to have robotic eyes, we're going to see huge amounts more. Like, for example, and it's not just, you know, for fun and art. I mean, you walk into a bedroom with your child sleeping, and all of a sudden you see carbon monoxide. You know totally. there's a dangerous element, or you know something like that. And these are kinds of things that'll be very practical. From a, from a very, um, I'm just writing an article right now on robot nannies, and the robot nannies, um, you know, like the Jetsons, can actually like see Rosie. the tiny. <laughs> yeah, like Rosie. They can see the tiniest poisonous spider on the wall and recognize it, whereas a human being would never, ever see that, and they can see it in the dark. Sure. And we, we're entering an age when safety and practicality and functionality is going to dramatically change. And at some point, this is – I'm the big believer in the – there's about six companies around the world right now working on a bionic eye. And because we have two eyes, I'm a big believer that a lot of people will probably – upgrade their eyes and they can already make eyes look so you can't really tell the difference Mm -hmm. my father lost an eye because of diabetes so i've been pretty you know following the eye industry and um the robotic eye is going to allow you to see literally 20 30 times further um much closer it's going to allow you to see dangerous gases it ties right into your optic nerve and you can do you can replace one without actually like losing your biological eyes so it's it's a kind of a win-win situation. So I'm a big believer that probably so they already have robotic eyes here, but probably within ten to fifteen years, there will be commercially available robotic eyes that are better than your eyes for a majority of things. Mm-hmm. And, and like record anything, things, you'll the, be able to stream the, media through them too. Yeah. Wow. I mean, yeah. The, I mean, obviously, a lot of the stuff we're even talking about is very infantile. It's just basic improvements. But so a bigger deal would be ending death or life ex- exponential life extension, at least. That, that, that seems inevitable that we're going to dramatically increase life expectancies. That's, that's a no-brainer. And maybe to the point of ending death, is that something you, you really genuinely believe that we can end voluntary, end voluntary death? Yeah. Well, yes, yes, 100%. I think actually within 15 years, you're going to start hearing about people that are really no longer dying. In fact, uh, you've probably heard of cryonics before. Cryonics is, yeah. um, and just your listeners, when you freeze somebody in hopes of bringing them back to life, most transhumanists like myself, there are these special tanks of nitrogen. We actually don't consider people frozen to be dead. We actually think that that's emergency medicine, just the fir- the most extreme kind. Uh-huh. Because we know the technology is coming to bring them back to life. We've already done it with certain types of worms. We've done it with certain types of animals. So, And they now have um, this saline solution where in Pittsburgh, the FDA approved it. They're now taking gunshot victims and putting the solution in them. And for about four hours, keeping these people clinically brain dead, every type of dead you can, totally dead. And then bringing them back to life, like somebody had fell into a, fallen into a frozen river. Mm-hmm. So, and that technology is just expanding quickly. So, my idea here is that even if people can die through some type of terrible tragedy, like it's going to be a while before you cut off someone's head and they can put it back on. That's that's even though I know there's been some test stuff on mm-hmm. that. That's you know, or, or somebody being burned, you know, into ashes. That's going to be, you know, yeah. uh, decades out. But to if somebody dies from lung cancer. We are working on artificial lungs. If somebody dies from, um, you know, so we can replace it with the artificial lungs, just completely take it out. If somebody dies, you already see here are people carrying their heart in a backpack. There are a number of human Americans right now who have their heart in a backpack. They carry it. Their heart failed, but they were able to get another one and just a pump in a backpack with a battery. You know, it, it, these things are, you know, organ. The heart is a pump. I mean, it's not that difficult to recreate. That's how we're going to keep people alive. It may not be the the way that you want it right now, like the yeah. fountain of youth where you drink something, but that's coming too. But that's still 30, 40, 50 years out. So but in weird, 10 to 15 years, it's going to be good. There's a weird thing that's going to happen if, if we cure cancer, heart disease, 
Uh, and we even get into your gene- genetics and fix the telomeres or whatever causes aging or cell damage, whatever those things are. Even if we do those, we will end chronic causes of death. But the biggest, de- the biggest cause of death for a long time will be uh, accidental death, right? That will become the leading cause of death. It'll be, yeah, oh, he got yeah. his head chopped off at some point. If cancer, yeah. if you can repair anything because you have a, a, a time frame to do it on cancer, heart disease, well, you don't it, for murder and you don't for, you know, accidental yeah. deaths and, and things like that. So that literally would become the leading cause of death. And no matter what, eventually, if the timelines got long enough, I mean, it would just be a matter of time before you eventually had an accident or um, were murdered. Yeah, That'd and, be- and uh, in transhumanists, <laughs> I never talk about like living forever for that exact reason. And that also sounds weird to live forever. <laughs> what we talk about is, What's wrong with 500-year lifespans? And you're right. Something Statistically, something's always going to go wrong. It's not going to be perfect. Um, but that's a lot better time than we have now, especially if you, you, know, you have a child, especially if you have a child who has leukemia, and all of a sudden, you, you know, that's terrible. Like, we got to get rid of leukemia. That's, that's a priority mm-hmm. number one. Children should not have to die. And, um, and then, you know, I think probably assist uh, euthanasia of some sort, if people don't want to live that long, they'll be able to, um, you know, check out. And then there's also this idea that maybe um, if you want to die, you'll die through a cryonics procedure and say, you know, bring me back to life in 100 years and I'll see if I want to hang around. And <laughs> I'm you taking can kind a of nap. Come and go as, Take a as century you nap is what that'd be. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that would be fun, too, because I... You know, I got to be oh, honest. It likes horrible. exhausting. You know, so there, there's, there are times that you may not want wow. to be alive, or you want to, you want to go into a deeper sleep for a while, and you just want to set your computer yeah. on, you know, low mode or whatever. So it is. you'd be gambling then that the future is going to be a better place and not a dystopia. You know, like, oh, you'd be you like wake a, up in Terminator. You're like, oh you know, crap! You're I should have enjoyed the golden age while I had the chance. Now it's all, you know, something terrible. But that, you know, that, that to me is weird because I feel like and this is leaves technology a little bit this is a little bit of just psychology or something but i feel like the older you get you get cranky and grouchy and some of that is because oh your bones hurt this or that whatever but if you think about being married to your wife for 50 years oh that's amazing uh but it gets difficult like relationships and humanity is strained so i have a thought that the older you got, if your body even was in great health, you might become more grizzled and bitter and hate-filled as a person as you experience life. Because a lot of, you know, relationships ultimately are all, almost always strained. And we look at a kid that's three years old or seven years old, and you think that's the best. It, and it almost only gets worse for them. Like some stuff gets well, better, but in a way, you can't you can't reverse the the purity that you that you get when you're young. No, no, totally. And you know. I mean, kind of think gets about, into, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but just think of, no. uh, you know, a 95 year old grouchy old man. What about a 500 year old grouchy old man? He didn't want to. Yeah, no, totally. So this gets into quite some of the, you know, why my presidential campaign has actually become so popular is because I promote a whole bunch of things that literally destroy various American institutions. I'm, I'm not a believer in marriage. Okay. I'm married now and I have a nice wife and I'm, <laughs> I have a family, but in a thousand year lifespan, right. I don't think monogamy is is a is a is a good, a sane <laughs> kind of program. I mean, mm-hmm. we're talking about biological animals and that's why we're doing it now. But we're not gonna be biological animals if we're uploaded or if we're part robot or you know, the sex drive can be satisfied through a chip. There are companies out there that are working on stimulating the erogenous zones in your brain brain right now. So, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of things like that that are happening. Like you would ultimately be able to choose if you wanted to have a sex drive and how so strong or if you wanted to stay monogamous. I guess everything would just wind up being choices is where it would head, right? If you want to die or not, it's your choice. That's what everything would kind of converge to. Yeah, hey, I'm losing a little bit, but you're still there uh, sitting in. I said, so it seems like everything would just kind of converge to you have the choice of everything. Do you want to have a sex drive? How strong do you want it to be? Do you want to live? Do you want to die? All those things just become choices at some point. Yes, yes. No, I, 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 you know, and I think this is something that's going to have to, you know, everyone's going to have to make an individual choice. But the good news is that the choice is there. Um, I think one of the most important things is technology gives us more choices. And I think if we know we're going to live a thousand years, 
you're going to take the marriage concept much more differently. Mm. Also, would you have children in the first hundred years of your life <laughs> if you knew you were going to live? Yeah. Of course. Yeah. And, the, you know, pretty certain that lots of institutions. I, I talked about the death penalty recently. I, I'm against the death penalty because I know that in the future we're going to restructure people's brains very easily. So those people that are killers or serial killers – we can make them nice yeah. human beings. Maybe they don't want to be, but from a societal perspective, it makes right. sense to put a little chip in their brain and say, now you like mm -hmm. Disneyland. You like being a nice human being. Well, that's better to me than murder, you know, than killing them. But that just changes this very fundamental controversial idea of the death penalty. And it just shows how technology can literally change the entire landscape of human uh, societal existence. Yeah, and so I, I get that. And that's why it's important to make it political or on the front of stuff because – some of the stuff that we try to solve as societies, we don't use the technology approach. We use the social approach or the – I don't know what the other stuff is, but we're not really using what may be our biggest asset because it is, A, scary, and then it's also maybe a decade or two off. But those are the types of things we're going to need to deal with to deal with the planet in the future. We're going to need to deal with corrections, uh, human you know, people in that way. We're going to need to deal with existential threats and stuff like that. And there's no better, you know, there's regular old policy isn't uh, isn't going to do the trick on those things. It's going to have to be advancement and energy, uh, energy being able to have unlimited energy or get it from n nuclear fusion and all these things are going to be the way out of all of our problems. Of course, and you know, and this has been a, hu a huge amount of what my campaign is about. Is yeah, I have no chance of winning. I just tell people, look. The 20-year, 20 25-year political window is quite different. We're almost certain to have machines that are smarter than human beings. So are we going to continue to have human presidents? Why would we have a human president when we could have a robot president that makes much better decisions <laughs> for us? But that's not just it. You know, it's it's everything. It's, it's the idea of education. Can we put chips inside our children that teach them Spanish? Well, frankly, um, most experts think that's another type of thing we're going to be able to do. So, you know, here, you know, here I have my three, a five-year-old and a two-year-old, and we're already going through Spanish lessons. And I'm telling my wife, well, maybe we can just buy that chip in 15 years. Yeah, and, should, and, and this is all crazy stuff. Yet at the same time, there's no question in my mind, I live in Silicon Valley. I've seen the manufacturers of these places. We're moving to mm -hmm. this, um, this era. And it's not that we're moving there slowly. It's that if you have a two, if you have a five year old daughter like I have, she's never going to learn to drive ever. Right. She's never going to worry about drunk driving with her behind the wheel because she's never going to drive. And that's a very different perspective than you and I grew up with. I think mm -hmm. definitely. And I have a three year old daughter, so I'm in the same camp there. Five, man, that's insane that it'll go that fast. But let me tell you something that works against what you're saying from from my point of view here. I live in Seattle. We are just now getting our mass transit system. Okay. And so we got this light rail that's awesome, and it goes to the airport to downtown. It doesn't come to my neighborhood yet, but they're building a station right over here. And I'm really excited about it. It'll be done in 2024 or some, so 2022, something like that. It, it'll be past 2020 when the thing is complete. And I said, and I said what, what the hell? I mean, I thought technology was supposed to go and be fast, but this, at least this form of technology, as it pertains to the government, and what we're doing here in Seattle, it's going to be five or six years before the light rail to my house is complete, which makes me, which, you know, I, I don't know if, what the what the holdup is there, but that's that sounds different than solving all our problems through technology in fifteen years. And, and that that is that is something I run into all the time is that I've been telling people again and again that technology and innovation, like the kind of innovation that you you know you and I are using through Skype right now, mm -hmm. that kind of like I see you, you see me. The, the, uh, the technology we have in our smartphones and the chips in my hand, that's changing so much more rapidly than Social Security reformation sure. or taxes right. reformation or the way our government is structured. It's like I talked about this. I, I wrote an article about this. I, you know, I support the uh, I support the right to bear arms. I, I, I'm, I'm sort of a libertarian guy in some ways. And um, but I try to say that. People don't understand. I have a neighbor. He has drones. He has a 3D printer. He can, for like $25,000, create 100 drones that are all armed because he bought you know 100 bullets at Walmart for like 10 bucks. And now he can go to the Super Bowl and fly them over there and do a mass killing very, very quickly. And, yeah. I, and he's not going to do that, but <laughs> I'm trying to give you the idea that 
the idea of mass um, mass weapon attacks has changed because of technology. Absolutely. The Second Amendment, even though I believe in the right to bear arms, no longer can protect the kinds of things that people can do for the cheap. Our entire Constitution was written in quill pens for people that had muskets. We need to, as a, as a country, as a world, start thinking about how fast technology is affecting our society. Genetic editing, uh, well, what do you mean somebody is going to have a third or a fourth arm and then wants to compete in the Olympics? I mean, what does that even mean? Like, this is a very different type of era we're entering. And I think yeah. a lot of people um, haven't uh, haven't thought about it. It's, like I said, it's again why my campaign has done really well. It's not because I'm uh, qualified to be president. I'm too young. I don't have any experience yet. But it's because I'm asking questions that for the very first time are being asked in a political and a legal format, and everybody realizes um, that these are things that need to be answered. Mm -hmm. And they can't be answered in the way America has been answering things, take 10-year studies, and yes, we'll worry right. about it later. Actually, the CRISPR technology is here. People are modifying their dogs. China is starting to look at augmenting their children's intelligence. Does America want the Chinese, the next generation of Chinese kids to be smarter than the entire generation of Americans because we had ethical yep. quandaries? That's right. I mean, you talk about guns. I mean, that's a technology. That's all that is. And now, oh, it's a big problem. But, I mean, it won't be the big – you take away every single one of them. We'll have much more efficient weapons that will be affordable and – accessible like dr drones with who knows what drones or biological weapons you can make with your computer in a little lab i mean that that has to be you could murder somebody with a virus when you be able to program it and not long from now you don't worry about guns the bioterrorism kits on ebay that you can create incredible amount of they're crazy called bioterrorist stuff. kits well, they're, they're just yeah, they, that's what we're they're known in the in, you know how we refer to them, but they're under a thousand dollars. If you just have a basic master's from most any other you know from most any university in America on biotechnology, you know how to create some terrible things. And if you're lucky and you come up with an anom anomaly to anthrax or some of these other things or some other viruses like SARS, whatever, I mean, you can decimate huge populations levels now or target individuals. That? In yeah. a drug related war, whatever. Yeah, and it's it's so we we are not equipped as a society to deal with how quickly um, the world is unfolding. Uh, I love science and technology, but one of the three platforms of the transhumanist party's uh, you know main thing. So the first one is we were trying to get science to uh, you know use science to live indefinitely. The second one is we're trying to spread a culture of science, a, a pro culture, you know, pro science culture. But the third one is existential risk. We have real worries to worry about. I mean, people are not paying attention. There was an asteroid that came within, you know, 30, 40,000 miles of the planet. Mm -hmm. The dinosaurs went out that way. We have 25,000 nuclear weapons that are live right now on planet Earth. Uh, you could easily knock the the planet out of its uh, axis. You know, I mean, we have a million different types of existential threats, whether it's Ebola or other things like that. And no one takes that stuff seriously because it's become, you know, it's just, anyways, we worry about it. the transhumanist party. My campaign worries mm -hmm. about this stuff to try to say, preserving humanity, preserving the, the brilliance that the human species has arrived at yep. is priority number one. Okay. So that brings me to what is the most interesting part of this in question is, are we, it, it, are we just pro-human no matter what? Is it just humans are the best because we're humans and we protect that? Because I like to think the human project is that's my team. I think that way. And I'd, I'd love to see the humans be better, improve. But on the other hand, is there, I mean, is it not possible to just, that we're humans and we're just a step and then maybe we even, allow you know humans have a limited time and we're just participating and then we're, we're going to evolve past humanity and 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 technologically so is that somewhere where, where you think and people would would say or does it end with optimizing humans you know i believe that we carry the very best traits of the human being with us and in fact i believe we carry the very best traits of the reptiles that we evolved from uh, and in my opinion, you know, with us, the, uh -huh. the very best traits of maybe even just viruses, you know, that we evolve. I think every single, you know, age 
should take what is the very best and build off that. Because, you know, the next age is certainly the machine age where we become cyborgs and probably, like I said, a but robotic arm. will we still arm. be we'll, humans? Well, I, I mean, that's the question. What is human? Now, if we're living in a, in a simulation anyways, it, what does it really mean to be human? I think what we're trying to say is there's something about us mammals that love one another, care about one another, want the best for one another. Well, if that's what it means for humans, I think we can also be part machine and still want that for one another. And I think that, you know, caring about the environment. So I plan, that's why for me it's very important that transhumanism has the word humanism in it, because I want to carry the very best of the human body, the human being, but the human spirit. To post -human, in, to po are we? are you looking at a post-human future? Do you hear me there? That you know, I, I lost you a little it, bit. Are we looking at? Are you looking forward to a post-human future? Well, we, we're definitely looking forward to a post-human future, and I, I do specifically. But I would never want to leave behind the human element mm -hmm. because, for me, uh, I wouldn't even know why I would go forward if I wasn't part human. But there are elements of the human species that I do want to leave behind. I want to leave behind war. I want to leave behind crime. I want to leave behind maybe hatred. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are things we can evolve into that would be better than what we are now. And, uh, you know, I think, in fact, that follows a lot of the, the great religions, is this idea that we are evolving into a better spiritual creature. And, uh, I, I, you know, for me, whether that's machines or people or, you know, whatever it is, for me, as long as it's a, a better entity and a more sophisticated entity, I'm on board. Well, but okay, I'm still I'm still lost in my own head, not because I'm not following what you're saying. But if you look at it biologically or evolution thus far, we go natural selection until speciation occurs, which is when you can no longer interbreed with the other species. So we would have to. Has evolution ended, or are we entering into a new kind of evolution? Because technically, do we have natural selection anymore, or if we're manually selecting for it? Does that even count? Is evolution even the right word for that? And then this was this one's the other fork of that question is what if we get this AI and it's just superior to us? Maybe we maybe this is our phase of evolution. We're just a homo habilis or whatever it is, and we just defer and then that artificial intelligence that we create moves on and we say, Go ahead, wipe us out. You're better than us anyway. We created you. We're the caterpillar, you're the butterfly. Y'all go on ahead of us. I mean, is that a, is that a reasonable point of view? <laughs> In, in my campaign, in my party, we don't support creating an AI or a machine that's superior to human beings. I only support that if I am directly connected to that machine. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say, oh, we're going to create artificial intelligence. It's going to be the greatest thing that's ever happened. But I actually believe that we should not create another species that's smarter or stronger than human beings unless we are directly, either through neural interfaces or through wires or whatever, connected to it because I have no I have no intention of creating the Terminator and then losing mm -hmm. saying oh so sorry to the human race right I want to keep my humanity and add it in fact when you think about our symbol it's humanity plus that's that's the transhumanist humanity symbol plus. so it's always humanity plus a bit more yeah and that's really where transhumanism is yeah well that's I think of it as just you know, the human project. I'm excited about creating media and art because I think it contributes to human stuff. So, I, and to me, believe in God or not, that's what God would have people to do, I think, if you read it correctly anyway. It's improve the welfare of other humans, help as many as you can, do the best you can with what you have here, uh, continue to grow. I think those are all things that, that, that totally line up with... Uh, secular humanism or faith if, if done right i mean i think i just think those things make sense but it gets really tricky when you think of introducing stuff that could change or end or become post-humanity that really that's when i really get lost but it's really exciting it's really exciting to think about but it, why yeah, no, wouldn't I, if we could create more ethical creatures than us that are not human why why wouldn't that be better well it probably would be better if you're thinking in terms of like you know, I hope, for example, that my kids are better moral and superior animals or superior mammals or, mm -hmm. or living entities than myself. And I would be proud to do that. 
So maybe, you know, we will give birth to some kind of creature that is better than us and we'll, you know, our mortality will take us and we'll lose and they'll go on. And I would feel okay with that, but hopefully that wouldn't be so different than myself yeah. that I, I couldn't even associate it with. I, I think personally, I would like to stay on board, yeah. uh, be a part of the ship. I don't need to be the captain, but, um, and, uh, hopefully, um, I will be directly, you know, the way AI is going to unfold, probably in 10 years, we'll have an artificial intelligence that is equal to the human mind. And, and could then very 10 quickly seconds be, later, it'll be a million times more. And then it turns the, the lights worry. out on humanity, right? <laughs> that's exactly the worry. That's exactly. And I've written about this endlessly. The thing, though, is if we're directly connected, we don't, we don't turn on the on switch until we're sure that our brains are are either neurally or some way connected. And then we turn it on when we leave, when we make that growth, um, that could be the next evolution of, of the human species. And some human element will be a part of that. Yeah. Um, it would be even, bit- in, in no matter what, in the same way that you say we have parts of the deep reptile brain in us and things along the way. So no matter what, even if AI continued without us and iterated many other times it would always contain humanity as a part of it that's how you know it would always be of part course, of the history of regardless if there's now, no I humans pers- on earth for the next thousand years and it just continues for ten thousand years then we're still we're still you know there in a way <laughs> of course of course and i i agree with that i don't want that to happen because i want to be oh. there like you and i the way we are right now i'm yeah. talking to you you know me i know you i want to be there like watching it with my own eyes But at the same time, I realize that maybe we're not in control. Maybe technology has always been in control. Like I said, there's a trillion galaxies out there, and each galaxy has 500 billion planets and stars. Maybe there's a lot more going on than we actually even know. Um, Maybe it's uh, spirituality. Maybe it's God. Maybe it's uh, a total void. I don't know. And maybe it's just a terrible destiny. But uh, I think I tend to think optimistically of it that we are humans. We're creating a better world for us. We're evolving ourselves at this point, and hopefully we're going to make it so that whatever, wherever that train goes, we're on it, and we're going to enjoy the ride. Yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting to see, can we improve, or are our flaws inherent in, in what we are? That's kind of the big yeah. question. Yeah, of course, a huge question. If our flaws must tack along for the, the ride, or if that's, some, you know, what, that's what makes <laughs> you human, it's like, you know. Of course, that's a great question. Is it is it our flaws that makes us human? And philosophers have debated that for centuries now. That's a very funny thing because you're like, well, if you can live indefinitely, well, wouldn't you get bored or wouldn't life lose some of its meaning? But these are inherently difficult questions, you know. And I, you know, I don't have all the answers. I just want to get there to find. Yeah. You know, I want to ask the questions you, and see what happens. Do you think you're going to make it? Do you, you think that you're going to survive or become uploaded? Like, do you intend on not dying personally? Like I, yes, I don't yes. like I'm into all the stuff you're saying. I'm, I say green light everything, but I don't actually have any belief personally that that I'm not going to die in, in 50 years. I, I would be very surprised if I die. I, I think <laughs> <laughs> a very. I, I think it would be terrible and tragic. And, and the reason is is because I have just been to some of the conferences talking to the people doing the reverse aging stuff. And it's coming along so quickly. What's happened in the transhumanist movement is in the last um, few years, the amount of money going into it has not just quadrupled. I mean, it's gone up 20 times. So there's a huge amount of money that's finally filtering in through the life extension science uh, phase. And um, the government's actually showing a little bit of interest as well. So we might come to a point when many, many universities get many billions of dollars to figure out this idea of, of stopping aging. And if Absolutely that happens, insane. then that could change. In 10 years, we could conquer aging. It's, it's all about, it's about money. It's about resources. Man, it's about, that's insane that you really believe that. I'm not saying you're insane, but that's just a, such a profound thing. If so, like I was saying earlier, you should really be concerned with accidents. I mean, you should really be a safe. <laughs> if you think I, that I, I you're not going to die, don't, I mean, you really should limit your amount of time in cars and on bicycles and stuff. You know what I mean? Like, th- how risky so is that to your thousand-year future? 
a, a lot of transhumanists are already do that. I heard transhumanists say that they don't want to walk near freeways anymore because of the pollution from cars. Yeah. That's how picky some of these people <laughs> are. And I, 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 you know, I'm a National Geographic guy. I don't really, I've been to war zones. And I don't, you know, I, I feel like that's kind of wimpy, but they maybe they're onto something. Yeah, if you're gonna have to, I mean, you don't know what's. To, um, that's 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 really. So you have no intention of you or your children dying. Like you think your kids are into this new world and it's, they're just gonna, you know, take it over and we're gonna usher in a new age. Like it'd be the most significant thing. You think the most significant thing ever to happen in human history is going to happen in the next few decades? Then that's your belief. Yes, I, I, I'm certain that a couple things are going to change everything. Either the advent, the you know, the creation of artificial intelligence, or we're going to figure out this CRISPR technology stuff, um, or you know, um, some other kind of technology is going to come out. They're already working on improvements to this genetic editing. So I think we're about, like I said, whatever happened in ten years is going to happen in five years. Then it's going to happen in two and a half. Then it's going to happen one and a quarter. I mean, so we're only looking at twelve to fifteen years out before everything converges at all right. at once, and history is made. And like I said, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, if you and I did this interview in 15 years, we are holographically being channeled in right. uh, like Star Trek stuff, because that's how quickly innovation grows, assuming governments allow it to do so. Yeah, I think that's a big part of it. But but the big prediction would be, though, that'd be the most significant thing that really ever happened in human history so far, and it's right around the corner. It is, and, and this is what makes it so exciting, and especially for some at your age, my age, I'm only 43, and especially our children's age, um, we're going to watch all these things happen. This is no longer just like, um, you know, it's end times, I hate to say it. I mean, I, even I believe in the end times, uh, just from, a, you know, being brought up as a, as a Catholic, but end times doesn't have to be something that's uh, necessarily this great tragedy or a great apocalyptic thing. It just is going to be revolutionary, and maybe that was what it was meant to be all along, is something very different happens with the human species. That's amazing. Plenty to think about there. I'm going to uh, not keep you any longer because I appreciate you giving me this whole hour here. But I've really enjoyed this. I could spend, I could just, like I said, this is my favorite thing to do is explore stuff. Just explore the ideas. I have so many more things I'd like to think about and talk about. But uh, thank you for, for humoring me for an hour tonight, Zoltan. Oh, I've had a great time chatting with you. It's great for me, too, because it makes me go through all the concepts. Mm -hmm. I, I spend a huge amount of my time just dealing with politics, and this is the stuff that I love, too. I, you know, I love delving into these ideas and thinking them out. Well, there's probably some more stuff we could talk about. We could do it again. Good luck with your campaign, and if anybody's more interested in you or your campaign, then it's Zoltan Eastvon.com. Just your name. It'll be in the show notes. <laughs> Absolutely. And just, you know, Google my name and I, I write a bunch of columns, mm -hmm. uh, have a book and all sorts of stuff. So uh, lots of videos out recently. So anything that your, your listeners want to see or whatever, it's all out there on the Internet. All right. Well, I appreciate it very much. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you.